So I'm going to, to talk uh, this morning about uh, multinationals and, and public policy. And I'm going to start by saying something about really the relationships between uh, multinationals and host governments. And I think Jonathan Slow is talking, uh, he'll be talking about that in Scotland, uh, won't he? Yes. So you have another speaker on Thursday who's going to talk about the Scottish dimension of this, but what I'm going to say early on is linked to it, but I'm taking a developing country perspective. But the more important issues that I want to speak about this morning are to talk about the, not only the national perspectives on uh, multinationals and public policy, but uh, particularly the regional and multilateral perspectives. And I don't know if some of you have heard about uh, the recent initiatives, sort of mega regional initiatives on public policy. One is uh, um, the TTIP initiative. It's, it's TTIP, but it's, uh, it clearly was the, an American who devised the short form of it. And they call it, and therefore everybody calls it TTIP. Um, and the other one, which is the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, and the other one is the TPP, which is a Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. So, t so these are ongoing, and I thought it might be interesting uh, for you. So, so my objectives this morning then, first of all, is to, uh, to understand the importance of the public policy environment associated with uh, international business. Uh, secondly, to consider the levels at which public policy operates. Uh, national, international, um, sorry, national, regional, and, and multilateral. And also to consider then these new current initiatives. Uh, so let me just start then with, uh, with some background uh, on this. And to look at the different relationships that, or, or the different objectives, sorry, that, that uh, multinationals and host governments have. Now, multinationals clearly are there to um, create profits, and uh, they do this through their strategies, which might be local, but more commonly nowadays would be regional, or also common would be global strategies. And I guess this is part of the, the, your, the, your course. Um, so they make choices on the countries they're going to, uh, to enter, the activities they pursue, and so forth. And you, you know, I'm sure, or you will know, about the motives for um, multinationals. Either they look for markets, or they look for uh, resources, or they look for costs, uh, or indeed more recently, they're more interested in also in uh, knowledge creation, looking for assets. C uh, the companies have a, a, a sort of a kind of choice process that they go that they, they go through, and it's not uh, unfamiliar between different nationalities. They start out really looking at the regional level uh, first of all. So they look, say, we want to come to Europe, um, and then they gradually narrow the process down to looking at a country, um, and then to a locality within the country. But I think I I know an example from way back, long time ago, where they were actually also looking at the, the, the global level, which is uh, rather unusual. And this was a case of, uh, of Ford, the, the American motor company, which uh, had made a decision uh, to establish an operation in Spain. This is a long time ago, years ago. And the headquarters, the European headquarters of Ford, they decided it was going to be in Spain. But then it was it was that was rejected by the, uh, the headquarters board of Ford and Detroit, and they moved the project to Brazil. So it's not just uh, clearly uh, intra-regional. It's also, it, sorry, it's not just within the region. It could also be global in that respect. Um, right. So, so these are the, this is what the multinationals do. Then what do, what do host countries do? Um, they're looking to attract uh, multinationals within a, a, a highly um, competitive environment, highly competitive marketplace. Just to give you an illustration how competitive it is, I suppose it's not really, this, is, this is not really competitive, but it shows the, 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 the width of, I suppose, the, the breadth of, of uh, 
uh, this. That I, I was in uh, North Korea some years ago, North Korea, not South Korea. Um, and I think uh, that year there were only 250 people, 250 people uh, from, the, from the West had, were in North Korea. So it was quite an interesting experience actually, especially uh, getting into the country because you have to walk over the bridge over the Two Men River. You know, I, so I had my case and I had to walk over the bridge. It was a bit like, you know, gonna get, you think somebody's going to shoot you from the other side of the bridge. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> and there was no road, uh, there was no road from China, no, no paved road from China into, uh, to the, they were making the road then. But once you got to North Korea, there was no, uh, there was no road and the bridge was, a, was only a footbridge. You couldn't walk, you could, there was no cars could go over it, yeah. So it was a bit bizarre. And then, uh, of course, there's no customs post because there's no relationships with anybody else. So there was this Land Rover pick, picked us up and took us in. So it was, uh, this was good fun, this one. But uh, I must say, I found the people I work with were really smart uh, people and uh, really good English as well, the ones I, I worked with. So that's beside the side. And, and stop me if I start wandering away here. Yeah. Um, right, so such companies, uh, sorry, host countries trying to uh, compete to attract foreign investment and more importantly is to generate benefits from their presence and uh, of course you come, it, the policy issue comes through designing policies to facilitate the process of attracting and it's not just attraction it's also benefiting from foreign direct investment and then there's another point that I made there. Okay so I have this framework for which really acts as a summary of uh, looking at the, the foreign direct investment uh, attraction and contribution process. And you could look at this almost like a strategic plan. If you were going to form a, a formulate a strategic plan for, your, for the country, then this is the kind of, these are the kinds of uh, uh, issues, I suppose, that you take into consideration. So obviously, um, Foreign direct investment tra attraction doesn't stand alone, uh, so it has to be set within the, the, the overall objectives for the, for the country, overall national ec uh, economic objective and social, I suppose, as well. Of course, you have some countries that uh, foreign direct investment is the, the, the national objective. And I was just thinking about this uh, when I was putting this uh, um, overhead, these, this presentation together. And if you look at Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, it's really been uh, designing its, its whole economic policy, economic strategy on attraction of multinationals from the United States. So that's, a, the, so that's the beginning to that, the objectives. And the next bit is all about uh, what are the determinants of, of uh, FDI attraction, very, very straightforward. The economic geography ones are, you know, clear there and if you, you really you can link these uh, the, these to the different motives you can link these to the different motives for FDI so the size of the country if the if you have a large company a, a, a large country a large you know, size in terms of population and basically in terms of income and if it's uh, st uh, stable then it might attract market seeking investment from the multinational firm um, if it has a lot of natural resources, as Mongolia does, then it attracts resource-seeking uh, um, FDI. And uh, I suppose the other issue that you see more, it's certainly in very important in developed countries, less so in developing, uh, the whole question about look, is the whole question about looking for knowledge, uh, knowledge resources, and that uh, relates to um, strategic asset investment. So that's the, so these are the, the determinants. Then you've got the, the supporting determinants, labor, infrastructure, institutions, local uh, enterprise development. I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. <coughs> um, it leads on then to, if, you, if you, you have these FDI determinants, then you devise your um, framework, <coughs> your regulatory framework, in order to capitalize upon the advantages that you possess within the country and to offset the, the disadvantages that might exist within the country. Right, so th this then, you, we then move on to the, the dimension of 
uh, investment attraction and uh, um, development. So, as, as I'm, I'll, I'll sh show you in five minutes or so, um, an investment promotion agency is uh, a, a, a key dimension uh, in government policies towards in attracting foreign direct investment. So they are concerned with promotion, targeting, facilitation, and so forth. But it's not simply the marketing dimension of this, the attraction dimension of this, which is important. It's also the issue about trying to sustain and indeed develop the um, multinational subsidiaries that you have within your location. And this is therefore, and this issue is called, the topic is called that of attracting expansionary or sequential foreign direct investment. And what that means is that if once, if once you've got a firm within the country, then you've got a, re a reasonable, have I, I'm blocking the thing for you, sorry. Um, so uh, you, can, you can attract the, the developmental or expansionary investments associated with that same country. And so um, countries, companies have, sorry, countries have operations in place whereby they try to um, attract this expansionary investment from, from firms. And it's estimated that around about uh, 50 to 60 percent of all foreign direct investment coming into the country is not from new firms, but it's rather from companies that are expanding from uh, an existing base that they have within the country. So that's aftercare. Uh, then we look at there's the, the, the contributions there and distinguishing between um, direct and also dynamic benefits. And the dynamic benefits are extremely important. And you know, I always, always go on probably um, ab about this whole issue about trying to develop on the basis of really stimulating your own domestic sector. So unless you have a, a, a strong uh, uh, small and um, small enterprise, small and medium-sized enterprise sector, which is going to capitalize upon, let's say, uh, ac or acting as a supplier for um, multinational subsidiaries in the country, then you aren't going to be successful, and that becomes really, really important. Right, I'll say just a few words about this next thing. Then, so I'm, I'll say a little bit about. Uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do now is just to say a, a few words uh, based on uh, a paper I did, which is here, uh, which you can get it on uh, all, the, uh, all the United Nations, UNCTAD is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. You can get all the material just on the web. I mean, it's all free. So if you just, you can go and get that report if you want it, if you're interested in it. Um, so... What the, the uh, UNCTAD do these reports, studies that, that are concerned with uh, are called investment policy reviews, and essentially these are designed to try to uh, present recommendations for improving the investment environment within the country and therefore the environment for attracting foreign direct investment. And there were 33 had been undertaken from 1999 to 2012, I think it was, when this was done, 2011, 2012. And uh, the report kind of summarizes what uh, the results were. And you find that it's very much uh, uh, going in alongside the nature of that framework that I, I uh, presented to you there. So you've got, first of all, you've got an investment promotion agency there. And I say, as I said before, it's a key institution for success. Um, but it, it, obviously, in a lot of cases, you find that uh, these uh, organizations within the country are not really efficient. I mean, they know, they know that they have to have one. But uh, gosh, when I went back, if I, OK, I, you can see it, I'm quite old. <laughs> um, but in, in the early days when I was involved with this, I can remember going to places where they had investment promotion agencies and they had no paper, you know, and it was just dreadful, especially in Africa. Yeah. So uh, the second lesson is about regional initiatives. So regionalization, you, you find very much 
that uh, multinational companies have this idea of regionalizing. Now, by regionalizing, it means that they can improve the size of the market. Uh, and so from their perspective, it's really quite important uh, uh, thing to do. And I have this theory, actually. Well, it's not a theory. Pavlos would criticize me for saying something is a theory when it's not a theory. This is not a theory. This is my idea, um, which is that uh, the, 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 when the American companies came to Europe, there was no such thing as Europe. Okay, we, there was an EEC, just about. Yeah. But uh, when they came, looking at it from the United States, the, the, these multinational firms used to say, they talk about Europe for the, for the, for the, for, for the first time. There was an idea that they, they drove, really, to some extent, integration within Europe. OK, you had the EEC, and then it gradually evolved. But the, firm them, the firms themselves had a major impact in terms of uh, creating as Europe, in inverted commas, Europe, from, from their perspective. So their, their policies were European policies, uh, essentially, before we had an, an integrated Europe. And I th I, my view is then, so this is a, a long story to get to a, sh a short conclusion, is that they, st they do the same thing now in other parts of the world. So having got this model, uh, they replicate this model wherever they go. Um, and I'm going to show about this in a moment. So, that's, so infrastructure matters, that's a big issue. Again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Human resources, okay, investment framework. That's all right. I, I don't want to speak too long on this. But, um, but if I can intervene, I yeah. think your, your previous point is interesting. And you, you, you implied that essentially regionalization is, is greatly driven by m and &E initiatives and strategies. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that uh, obviously the, the regional, of course, the, e, the EEC was, was instrumental, you know, to some extent. But the EEC, the development of the EEC was slower than the development of the multinationals to, to uh, integrate it within Europe. Uh -huh. And to some extent, the two things were, dry, you know, were um, complementary. Um, and you and think the, the, the same has been yeah, happening in other parts, in other regions of the world? That, that is correct. That, uh, that's happening in other regions. I'm, as I'm going to go on the show in a moment for Africa. Yeah. Um, so, that's, so thank you. If anybody's got, sorry, I don't want to make this just a, a one-way street. So if you've got any observations, please ju you know, just ask. And I'll stop and maybe have a discussion with you at some point. OK, so that's that. In institutions are important. I'm going to, st uh, to, you know, to speak about that clearly. So institutions are concerned with uh, questions of, of governance uh, and therefore questions about corruption too. Um, uh, okay, so there's the an investment promotion agency. And I'll just say to you, if you want to find some information about this investment promotion agencies, there's an organization called WIPA, W-A-I-P-A, WIPA. W A I P A, and it's essentially a, um, an organization which operates on behalf of all investment agencies. So you have to register, obviously, but you can get. So you can just go into their site, and you can find the re the, the uh, sites of all the uh, investment promotion agencies. Um, I was a judge once for their annual global prize. That was for the best inward investment agency. And recently, two years ago it might have been, uh, Jamaica won it. And that is interesting because we had a student here. She did this very course. She came from Jamaica. Her name was Jody K. Smith. Jody K. Smith, yeah. And uh, she's gone on from here to, to really rise in the hierarchy within uh, um, Jampro is the name of the Jamaica, Jamaica promotion, they call it, Jamaica promotion agency, JAMPRO. Uh, in fact, we've had, we've had quite a few students going on, going on to work for investment promotion agencies. And it's fairly obvious because you get clear good, have good uh, um, grounding, understanding from this and other, uh, other courses. Um, if you're looking for information also, you could try FDI Intelligence, which is uh, published by the Financial Times. 
just called FDI, small, all small letters, FDI, small letters, intelligence. You can easily get that on the web as well. <coughs> okay, so the, the mandate of these investment agencies uh, are, as you'll see several, uh, image building, investment generation, aftercare, monitoring, and so forth. I just, I just wanted to make a point about this, first of all, that you find uh, countries going into, or countries that are new to investment promotion, and they go into the business without really <laughs> understanding that the country itself has to have an image. You know, it's no good trying to promote investment in a country that nobody knows anything about. Uh, and consequently, the uh, first dimension in investment promotion has got to be building, building an image uh, for the country itself. Uh, and, and actually, it's, am it's, it's amazing what, you c what countries can do uh, if they put their mind to it. And you see, for, for instance, believe it or not, uh, that Rwanda, which was, of course, a war zone until very recently, uh, has got quite a number of investments now. Um, especially in natural resources, as you'd expect. And the same can be, but they have to build an Im image uh, associated with, let's say, a good government or, uh, you know, that the, the war is over and so forth. Investment generation, okay, that's where you're going into um, promote the investment. Then aftercare, I spoke about before. Um, now, the only last point that I wanted to make on this is that nowadays you're tending to see that the inward investment promotion agencies are sometimes being merged with export promotion as well. Uh, and you'll see when uh, Jonathan Slow speaks to you on, on Thursday that he will talk about Scottish Development International. And this is an, an organization that came from a merger of uh, the investment promotion agency here in Scotland. That, uh, sorry, the uh, yeah, sorry, investment promotion plus also export promotion. So the two things are brought together. And they're being brought together because of the fact that uh, multinationals are, are seen to operate global value chains nowadays. And global value chains mean that you've got uh, a lot of uh, trade taking place within the multinational. So the export, uh, the export dimension of this and the investment uh, dimension uh, now overlap to a large extent. Okay, regionalization. Here, so here's my uh, little thesis on globalization, sorry, on regionalization from a uh, an African perspective. So, um, I think uh, my argument is that regionalized, well, it's not an argument, it's a fact. Regionalization initiatives are becoming important in Africa, uh, where you've got three stimuli. First of all, some of the regional integration agreements are evolving into e uh, free trade areas. So, that's a case where they, 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 it's been driven by the, the, the public policy rather than by the multinationals necessarily. Yeah. Um, and I'm saying the East African community, which used to be in, used to comprise, anybody, been, anybody know Africa? No? East African community comprises uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, and it's been expanded now into the, the west towards Burundi and Rwanda. So that's one case. Another one is, this is, this is now here you've got a different driver of regionalization. Uh, and the driver is actually the donor agencies. Donor agencies, people who are providing money to you know, assist the country. Um, and so as part of their trade for, for aid schemes of the, the European Union, the ACP is an Africa, uh, Caribbean, and Pacific initiative. Um, so they say that, that they will only provide funding, the aid funding, if f for, for projects which are regional in scope. Hmm? So they won't provide pr uh, money for projects which are only comp uh, concerned with an individual country, only f if, it, if it's regional in scope. So that's the second driver. You know. uh, but the third one is the, the point that I was making before, arg arguing before, is that the companies are integrating the strategies themselves in Africa. Um, and I've seen it in uh, East Africa, sorry, in West Africa, uh, where you have, an, you have a regional integration agreement, which is called ECOWAS, but uh, really it's been driven by the firms themselves. And also in North, Af uh, in North Africa, when I was there in 1999 in Egypt, you were starting to see 
uh, integration across the North African region by the firms, despite the fact that, in fact, there was no regional integration agreement. Uh, they, they were doing it on their, bo their own. And this is not easy stuff, especially in West Africa. I mean, you're talking thousands of miles and lousy roads and so on, but they still find that they think it is beneficial to do this, uh, to integrate rather than to operate it and serve the countries uh, separately. Which, which one do you think <coughs> is the most common, Steve? The most common of the three? Uh, I would say it's probably the, the multinationals because the, uh, the, um, the regional integration agreements are, are quite an early stage in terms of their uh, development. So th the, the companies, I think, are, are you know, driving this. Because uh, if you accept my philosophy about yeah. them... Uh, That's the for Africa or for the whole world? Well, uh, then I don't know. You know I, don't have a, I don't have enough information really to be able to speak for... Right. Um, okay, infrastructure, I'd say, and this is very quick, I just want to do a couple of things on this. Infrastructure is a huge issue. I mean, you won't find it so much as a, 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 as a driver of investment in, let's say, this country where companies come here, they expect, the, or the, into Europe or other developed countries, they expect the infrastructure to be half decent, and so it's not such a, an issue. But in, in, the, in an emerging economy, it, uh, it, it really is. But... Uh, Look at, the, look at the private sector involvement in transport and energy in Africa. So 11% of the, the investment is coming through multinational firms, 6% uh, in water, but 62% in telecoms. Why? Why the difference? Right. Now is time for having some interaction here. Huh? Why do you think... Why is it difficult to get foreign direct investment in infrastructure? So infrastructure comprises transport, comprises uh, ICT, <coughs> comprises... Yes, please? Um, Both of you, yeah. Replacing infrastructure is going to be replacing from time to time. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes. Now we say that the first country in a country will be the one having to invest most in infrastructure while uh, companies coming after to use the existing infrastructure. Yes, yeah, that's right. But I think the, the, the key issue underlying this is that the infrastructure doesn't exist, you see. Um, and so that's, that, that is the key question. The key question is to tr how you get the funds to develop the infrastructure from the first place. If, it's a, you know, if you want roads or whatever it is, or if you want... Um, telecoms, but if you, if you look at telecommunications, I mean, the reason that it's grown so much is because it's cheap. Hmm? It's not like uh, fixed lines and so forth. So you can, uh, companies are happy to come along because the payback period is short, whereas if you're talking about uh, roads, you're talking long, long time uh, in, into the future for, for the payback period. And of course, during that period of time, all sorts of things uh, happen. Governments change, uh, country has civil wars, who knows what, what's going to happen. And I, I mean, I'll give you, and so what is, I mean, so, wh I mean the, as I said there, public-private partnerships have become the main mechanism for uh, multinational involvement. And this means that uh, country, companies enter into, if they do it, they, they enter into uh, um, essentially a, a, a system where you have a payback mechanism where they get paid from the, the uh, operation of the, the, the infrastructure that they're, they're uh, um, funding. So, give an example. I was in Jamaica, the first toll road, toll road was operating, just had, was just launched open, uh, when I was there. The way in which this was operated was through a private, uh, public-private partnership in which the, uh, the company paid uh, for the building of the road, built the road, and then charged the tolls and got their returns from the tolls. So there is a, that's a, you know, so there is an issue. But to, to illustrate the, the the dangers that are associated with it, only one week after that uh, that road was built, the toll road was built, there was a protest. The, the the road was closed by protesters complaining that the tolls were too high. So you've got a situation where the firm in, is investing something 
but then th they're finding that the, 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 the returns from it are not going to be the returns that they expected because, it, of course, what happened was the government then backed down and uh, reduced the tolls. And this is only a year, a year after, sorry, a, a week after the, the actual road had been, uh, had been set up and had been launched. So, uh, so infrastructure is a really big deal. Um, the dom domestic private sector, well, I think that's okay. Um, I, I, you know, I feel really strongly about the, the need to have a domestic, a strong domestic sector, especially in emerging economies, because unless you have a private, se a, a, a private sector ethos within the country, then you're not going to support uh, multinational subsidiaries in the country. Um, and moreover, uh, they are extremely important to act as suppliers to the multinational firms. Okay, institutions matter. Well, I've, I've, I've spoken about that already. I won't say any more. If you want to look at corruption levels, you can go into the website of Transparency International, um, and they have in indices for all the world about corruption, uh, about corruption levels. I'm not going to stop there. Right. So that's a, that's, that was really a little uh, introduction to, to what it is I'm going to say. Uh, and I was just, so I'm just trying to talk to you about uh, essentially the, the, the lesson of, of this is that government policies are really important within the country for uh, uh, you know, attracting and particularly for benefiting from, from multinational <coughs> firms. Um, and the way in which they do it has some similarities, but of course it varies, and it's a, it's, a, it's a different process that will take place in um, developed countries like uh, Scotland, for example, as the you know, speaker on, on Thursday will tell you. Um, but notwithstanding that, the principles of saying that government has to have a role, public policy has to be uh, influential in uh, uh, establishing multinational operators, attracting multinationals. So. What I'm going to go on now to, to speak about, what time is it? Have I been talking, how long have I been talking for? Half an hour? 25? 35. 35, oh gosh, how long is that? Okay, right, so now I want to go on, which is to what, talk about the real, maybe we'll, we'll stop, can we stop after about another half hour? Is that okay, yeah. I'd rather you, s you said a few, you said something actually, rather than me just. Uh, Any question. questions so far on uh, what uh, Stephen has presented, please? <coughs> please. Thomas, yeah. Question concerning clusters or industry clusters. Yes. Um, I find very interesting how um, the idea of how clusters could influence internationalization of maybe um, entrepreneurs or small medium-sized enterprises. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot, that, you know, there's quite a lot of work on clusters and uh, also as uh, the role, the, in terms of the role of uh, multinationals as so-called flagship firms within clusters and actually driving the cluster, if you understand, yeah. But there's also uh, e e equal work which looks at uh, how uh, multinationals benefit from clusters. So it's a kind of two-way process, I suppose. So multinational firms, ha ha you know, what you, what you do not want or what you can't have to be operated effectively, you can't have a multinational operating on its own, operating on a standalone basis. You know, it has to have uh, uh, a support, support of, of uh, suppliers and so forth around about it. Otherwise, it won't succeed. And, you know, we, had a, we used to have expressions that we talked about uh, multinationals in the old days as um, pyramids in the desert, yeah? What other words, what other terms would we use, Pavlos? Pyramids and the Devils. Uh, stand, yeah, stand alone. But so, so the stand alone things are hopeless, actually, from a, fr from a, devel a developmental point of view. Um, so by need, basically, an ecosystem of, of smaller firms? Yeah, yeah. Well, if they're going to be successful, otherwise, you know, uh, o otherwise, what happens? They just, uh, they, uh, from a government point of view or from the multinationals point of view, it means they import everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the, the, uh, uh, the benefits that are associated with it are, are clearly much very limited. Yeah? 
So that's why I, you know, I didn't say much about it because I didn't have much time. But essentially, trying to grow, trying to grow a, a, a private sector that can act as a, a feeder into the multinational firm is absolutely paramount of, of importance. Uh, and so you get small entrepreneurial firms and, uh, you know, and all sorts of things associated with it. So yes, it is, yeah. But cluster, actually, the, the one thing about clusters is that cluster initiatives have got to have some sort of basis. You know, you can't, you, you can't the, the, the evidence shows very clearly that you can't grow clusters from nothing. Do you understand? So the clusters themselves have to have some basis, let's say, within the economy where you can see, right, there is some competitive advantage here. Well, it could be, you know, it could be in, say, say, in medical and pharmaceuticals or whatever it is. It could be anything, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, then. So we'll, let's, let's go on to, to the main part of my uh, uh, talk this morning. This is the first time I've... Uh, I've given this talk, believe it or not. Um, so you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit rough on, at the edges. Um, okay, so the first thing I, uh, so I, I'm trying to get, what I want you from, from today, I want you to go away understanding that policy is not simply undertaken at the, at, at the country level. P policy is not simply undertaken at the country level. And that because of the characteristics of multinational firms, Almost by definition, they're multinational or they're global enterprises. Therefore, policy has to match the nature of the firm itself. Mm -hmm. And that's, what I'm, that's the basic argument that I'm going to set to you. But now, this is just a, I don't want you to bother about the economics, but, the, but the, 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 the whole issue about economic theory is that multinationals can improve gr global economic efficiency and uh, global welfare. And the conclusion then that uh, it, multinationals are similar to trade um, so that increased flows of FDI to be encouraged since they, ben they generate both global and national be benefits. That's the, so that's the positive side of it. That's the, that's the, the you know, l a long theory cut into four, four lines. Um, but it's also recognized that the companies, because they're large firms, can be dominant and within their market sectors and so forth, they can have adverse effects upon the welfare of uh, home and host countries through anti-competitive actions, that's right, pricing um, discrimination and so forth. So the policy implications are twofold. The first is that government policies should be liberalized. Straightforward conclusion. Um, and the second is that policies should be devised to encourage competition and to damage restrictive practices. So the liberalization fits with it here, and discouraging um, bu restrictive business practices fits with here. So that's the base, these are the basic aims of all, yes please, yeah? Yep. Yep. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So I would say that that's, I mean, you, you could argue that that's, uh, you know, linked in here. But, you, but, but yeah, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and I was just going to go on to say the, 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 this uh, straightforward theory. So, you, so you, then you'd be engaging in anti-competitive action, you understand? Because you have bargaining power with regard to the firm. And that's, you know, that is actually the crucial issue of the, le the crucial lesson of what I'm going to say in the next three quarters of an hour. So I think you've uh, uh, just, just got ahead of me a little bit. Yeah, okay, so, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, absolutely right. And it's a good question to ask and keep asking the same kinds of questions. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to say was, the who, who supports then this notion about free, mar free markets and open markets, apart from myself? Um, one, one is that they, they support free markets and open markets, that's for trade and investment, are supported by, by businesses, I mean, obviously, because they are the main drivers. Um, secondly, they're supported by some governments, not all governments. They're supported by the United States and the United Kingdom. They're supported by the Scandinavian countries, uh, Germany to, some, to a lesser extent, perhaps. Um, but 
I, I suppose it's probably right to say that the, the, the US and the UK have been the major drivers of, free, of uh, li liberalization. Um, and you see it in one noticeable example, and that regard, that issue re relates to the question about mergers and acquisitions. Now, if you look at mergers and acquisitions across frontiers, you'll find that about 90% or a very high proportion of them take place either in the United States or in the United Kingdom. Why? Because all the other countries have got restrictions on, on uh, acquisitions. So many of the European countries, you, you can't actually, uh, uh, or it's very, very, very difficult to try to acquire across borders. So the, the history of, of uh, mergers and acquisitions is a good indicator of the history, if you like, of uh, opening of markets and freedom, uh, freedom of markets. Okay, so that's that one. Um, and, this, and this is really an important, I suppose, political point as well as being a, an, a, an economic point. That is by no means certain that all governments would s subscribe or buy into this notion of, uh, of free markets. Okay, so that m let me just uh, move on uh, then to, and, I can, and I, I'll get your, your comments about this. So I'm s what I'm, my question that I want to ask for this now, I want to ask now, is why then do we need international policies rather than just national policies? N by international, I mean regional or global or whatever, yeah? rather than just national. Why do we need them? Um, so the first point I make <coughs> is that well, as well as their foreign direct investment role, I've made this point, said, said this to you already, multinationals are major exporters and importers. Now, as soon as they're export and importers, then goods are transferred within the firm. Um, as soon as goods are transferred within the firm, there has to be a price at which the goods are transferred from one uh, co uh, company, one part of the company to another. Um, and this brings in the whole notion about uh, transfer pricing and, uh, and in particular manipulative transfer pricing whereby uh, companies or, con or individuals indeed uh, use transfer me mechanism, uh, transfer pricing mechanisms in order to minimize taxation. Big deal, really big deal at present. Uh, I mean, I'd love to give you a lecture on that as well, but I haven't got, not today. Um, anyway, so in, internal transfer pr uh, me pricing mechanisms replace arm's length trade. Arm's length trade is when you, the same price, you, you charge the same price as you would just for a third party buyer uh, in your, your transactions. So all of these arguments, are, all of these points that are being raised here are arguments for why you need or why an individual country can't operate on its own. A, con a country can't operate against transfer pricing on its own because the transfer pricing is taking place across borders and by definition you need some uh, uh, mechanism at the international level to control it. The second issue is, incidentally, do you know the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? It's, it's, this, this stuff's all in the papers nowadays, it's uh, recently. Tax evasion and tax avoidance. Anybody know? Yeah. yeah? Tax evasion is illegal. Good. Good. That's it. That's it. That's it. Is, it. is, is legally. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's that's it. So yeah. So tax uh, tax avoidance, uh, um, tax evasion. Sorry, is a, is illegal. That's right. So it means that you're doing something uh, that uh, well, both it's no one's supposed to know about it and uh, it's uh, against the law. Tax avoidance means that you're using the, the limits of the law in order to get uh, around what it is you want to do, reduce your, ta re reduce your, your tax bill, basically. <coughs> Second point, multinationals are a principal source of innovation and multi multinationals seeking uh, IPR is what? Intellectual property rights, protection. So protection of intellectual property, crucial issue for multinationals who are the biggest uh, um, drivers of research and development in the world. So they want to protect their intellectual property. But then if they protect their intellectual property, this goes against 
the or may go against the the uh, uh, the interests of other of develop, uh, developing countries in particular. And a good il illustration came with regard to pricing of pharmaceuticals. Uh, I can't remember which pharmaceutical drug it was, but anyway, I'll give you the example. Um, so the, the, the developing countries complained that they were being charged pr uh, high prices for pharmaceuticals. I'll call them drugs, but it's pharmaceuticals. Pa paying uh, high prices for drugs. And so they, there was a big uh, uh, debate about this internationally. And eventually, the multinational firms gave in and they you know, re reduced the prices of the, these uh, pharmaceuticals. Now, from their point of view, you, you can see the issue because they, they would argue, well, what, suppose we, s we, give these, we sell these drugs uh, uh, cheaply or even we give them away, let's say, but sell them cheaply, then you might, th you might by, that, by that purpose, open up the market so some uh, uh, persons buy these drugs and then they sell them back into the developed countries and make a profit. So that was the whole debate that went on about this. But the whole, but so you can see, so there's another dimension of this, this where you can't have countries operating alone. You know, one country could not bargain with a, a multinational, the point you were making uh, on, that, on that particular issue. Third one is uh, technology potential, uh, technology transfer potential. Well, especially for emerging uh, economies, they are looking for technology to be transferred by the, by the multinational. Um, in the old days, it used to be thought that if you set up a joint venture, then you might have a better um, uh, means of extracting uh, technology through, the, through the, uh, uh, the, the, the enterprise, but it doesn't really uh, operate like that nowadays. Um, the reality is that, b that both firms want control of the technology. Um, and it's certainly right that if, they, if the company itself wants to maintain the, uh, its control of the technology, it would be better doing it through a wholly owned subsidiary than through a joint venture. But again, you see the, the conflict between developed and developing countries, or multinationals and developing countries. Fun financial flows take place, same issue really. Um, it's a question about government control versus uh, m and &E freedom. That's, you know, that's, what, that's, the, that's the argument there. Um, governments may well, under certain circumstances, want to impose capital controls. Multinationals want to have free movement of capital. Um, uh, and similarly, they don't want to be uh, affected by foreign exchange controls. So th there's an interesting issue here in, in relation to North, the North Sea oil industry uh, in Scotland. It was a kind of issue that came up in a debate over the referendum. Um, actually, last year when I came here to speak, I spoke about the, the referendum and the economics of the referendum. Um, Unfortunately, I was uh, sorry. Fortunately, I was I was wrong. Wasn't that right? Because uh, I thought there was going to be a, an a yes vote. Um, anyway, so what's the issue here? Yes, North Sea oil. So when when you look at the North Sea oil industry, it's highly capital intensive. Doesn't uh, uh, employ many, much in the way of labour. So therefore, its costs in terms of labour are very small within the North Sea. Therefore, its profits are high, and the profits are all. Uh, um, owned by largely multinational uh, investors or in international investors. So he hence the profits associated with North Sea oil really go, don't, don't stay in Scotland. Uh, you know, very high proportion of these would, uh, would be moved abroad. <coughs> and so, there are, so there are government uh, you know, questions again there, but it's, not, you know, it's, it's international, it's not just a bilateral issue. Competition policy, there's no such thing as an international competition policy. There isn't any. Um, the, there's, there have been attempts to do it, but the countries are so different in terms of the uh, policies they pursue that it's never been able to be approved. What you have got, uh, which is also problematic, is that the United States law has uh, extraterritorial requirements uh, extraterritorial uh, components of it, uh, constituents to it. So in other words, the Americans uh, use their own law and take it abroad, uh, essentially, apply their own uh, unilaterally. Um, and to some extent, the EU are doing the same. 
but there isn't a competition policy. And that's a, a big, big issue, because if you think of uh, global mergers taking place, you know, you buy, you buy one, suppose one multinational firm buys another multinational firm, then you've got, you may have uh, competition issues in, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 countries because of the fact that the, uh, well, because they, they may be creating, uh, you know, anti-competitive situations in these markets. And the final one is just to say that really uh, uh, trade and services, agreements and services have not kept pace with uh, agreements in manufacturing. And the consequence of that is that you might find trade being damaged or investment being damaged because of it, uh, especially when you find that such a high proportion of, of, of manufacturing industry nowadays has a, a high services component. So you need a services agreement, and that services agreement has got to be at an international level. So that's the argument. These are the arguments that I'm uh, highlighting here as a case for international agreements. Any questions on that? Do you, take, you accept the arguments I'm making here? Right. So the first level at which uh, these uh, policies operate are the bilateral level. So that's between, between two countries. Two, two countries set up a, an arrangement between each other. Um, and as, as I said there, large numbers of bits, as they call them, signed by na uh, national governments since the 1950s. And the EU has 1,400 of these alone. So these are agreements by the EU with individual countries around the world. Hmm? <coughs> what are the objectives? Well, for the capital exporting country and for the, that's the multinational, the aim is to get legal protection for foreign direct investment under international law. And so they supplement the laws of the, uh, of the host country. So they provide the, the, uh, the multinational firm with uh, stronger agreements against uh, um, uh, the host country government. For the capital importing country, as the host country, bits are one means of attracting foreign in investment. Why? Because they provide important signals regarding a country's investment climate. So it says if you have a, a liberal um, mechanism, it's easier to get investment because uh, companies feel secure. Um, and the bits guarantee non-discriminatory treatment for foreign investments. Big deal, doesn't matter what I'm saying, didn't any more than that. It, it, it means you can't discriminate, the host country can't discriminate against foreign investors as compared with domestic investors. So, conclusion, the most powerful partner can determine the terms. Yeah? Um, are you then talking about like industry-specific or they're countries. They're just countries. They're just country specific. Yeah, okay. um, and they would, uh, you know, apply across a range of industries unless there were exceptions written into the the, the, the agreement. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I had a look. You know, I was. I had a look, but then I got with so many of them, I didn't uh, do any <laughs> anything more than that. But, but primarily, they would be, you know, they're country specific. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the, you know, I'm, I'm just, just to, uh, I, I'm going to conclude further on on this, but the important, you know, it's really important issue here because they have been a, a big uh, source of the complaints that have taken place ab about, uh, uh, about multinationals in the, recent, in the more recent past. Um, so those are bits. The second one are regional integration agreements. So these are designed, region, regional agreements are designed to free uh, trade and free investment within the block, within the block. So company, so it's country, a series of countries getting together uh, and establishing uh, an agreement. I said there are over 200 of them. Um, some of them have, uh, the details don't matter there, 
Some of them include foreign investment rules, some of them don't. Um, so, the, the, well, here's some there are some examples. The, the EU is an ex a, really an extreme example, you know, the, the, the best example of deep integration, uh, deep regional integration, because you've got free movement of labor, sort of. You've got free movement of goods, sort of. Sorry, I'm doing a bit cynical. Shouldn't be that. Um, you've got free movement labor and, and uh, free movement of capital. Um, so it's, and you've got a, com a common currency, which the, the other uh, regional integrations don't have. The second uh, uh, best known one, do you know, well, do you know, you can tell me what these are. What's NAFTA? Yeah, who's, who's in that? Do you know about it? Huh? Who's? Yeah, who, who, who are the members? That's it. Yes, Mexico and Canada. That's right. Yeah. So that's a that's a well established uh, um, agreement with. Uh, well, there have been problems with with Mexico. Uh, I would say um, constraints against Mexico because obviously they wouldn't. They don't want to have uh, free movement of labor. Um, they've almost got it already with a uh, you know large inflow of um, illegal immigrants from Mexico, unfortunately. Uh, ASEAN, do you know that? Who knows that? People from Asia should know ASEAN. What does it, what does it stand for? Association, yeah, that's a good start. Yes, okay. Which countries are in it, do you know? Don't ask me, because I've forgotten. Sorry. Which countries are in it? ASEAN? Which countries? Oh. Yes. That's very, that's very good. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, very good. Yeah, so that's uh, ASEAN. That's ASEAN. It's a bit. It hasn't, uh, you know, made a lot of a lot of progress. It's really, you know, it tends. To, that's good. Thank you. Uh, um, I couldn't have done that. I'd have been guessing a little bit. I think. Um, so it has. It's. It's more. It's a lot of its rules are are not really f uh, fixed. Uh, I would say, and so. It hasn't made a lot of uh, progress, and the countries are very different. EFTA, well, there's hardly any countries in EFTA. EFTA is the European Free Trade Association. So that would be the countries that didn't join the EU. So that would be Norway, uh, uh, Switzerland, maybe four, four of them. What else? Iceland. Iceland, yeah. Yeah, it could be. Norway, yeah. Iceland, probably one more. Yeah. ECOWAS is the Economic Community of West African States, <coughs> EAC, East African Community, Mercosur. What's Mercosur? Mercosur is uh, countries in South America. Uh, it's almost going to, it's almost falling apart actually, Mercosur, isn't it, because of the different political um, issues that are, that are taking place within that, within that region. Um, but essentially, Steve, what you are highlighting uh, with the bold letters is that what Alan Ragman has argued, uh, that uh, regionalization is the end to globalization, no? Is the? End to globalization. Is an obstacle to... An to obstacle to globalization. To, to globalization. Yes, yes that, that would be right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it benefits... So essentially it benefits... It's discriminatory that it benefits... Uh, countries within the regional bloc, but, uh, you know, in essence, is discriminating because it, so th th the, country, the companies operating within the bloc get better conditions, let's say, for, for their trade and investment than they do with the rest of the world. Yeah? But don't we, on the other hand, lose that? Like, I'm from Germany. Yes. And they're like, for example, manipulated, like, profit and stuff. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the lower system in the US. Yes. So therefore I think the countries in the EU kind of gather together to have a strong point without giving 
bring up the uh, okay. Well, that's a good, uh, you know, that's a good, uh, a good, a good comment to make because uh, TTIP is exactly designed to eliminate that. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're going to come out and talk about it. Yeah. So that's good. Thank you. Yeah, but it's still discriminatory, you know, and still you, so you still got barriers to trade uh, between the United States and the, the, the European Union with under, the, with under these same circumstances. Now, you, you depends on your, your point of view on this, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, yeah. Okay, that's that. Then the last one are multilateral, if you like, global investment trade agreements. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about history, about the uh, multilateral agreements. So essentially, uh, multilateralism goes back to the, uh, the, the 1940s, the end of the Second World War, when the whole series, all these international institutions that we know about, the United Nations, uh, the World Bank, um, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and the general agreement on tariffs and trade were, were established. And its, uh, its aim was essentially to, there you see there, reduce tariffs, non-tariff barriers, which we need to talk about, and quotas on trade, um, anti-dumping duties. Do you, know, do you know what anti-dumping duties are? Who knows what anti-dumping duties are? These are quite important. Yes? Yeah, it's the it's the it's the pricing rather than the quality. Yeah, that's that, that is correct. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a uh, definition which is that uh, anti-dumping occurs <coughs> if you sell products uh, abroad cheaper than they are at home, or if you sell products below the the price. Sorry, below their production price. That's but more or less it's what you said. Yeah, yeah. So that's anti-dumping, and you find that. Uh, the Within the, the general agreement on tariffs and trade, there's also a dispute settlement mechanism where state, uh, states uh, have, uh, you know, dis disputes can be settled between states. And a lot of the, the, the uh, disputes are actually about anti-dumping, and usually America versus China or something like that. Or, um, sometimes it's uh, Europe against the United States as it is in uh, airplanes, so it's Boeing, it's essentially Boeing versus Airbus through the governments. <coughs> so the big thing about this, the, the general team agreements on tariffs and trade took place through a, a series of rounds of negotiations. They called them tariff round, you know, uh, negotiating rounds. The first round was the Uruguay round, sorry, the Geneva round um, in 1947. Uh, and the, the next, to, next to final one was the Uruguay round in 1994. And the interesting thing that you note is the number of countries involved had went up hugely during that period of time. And there was a big Im impact on reducing tariff barriers. I mean, th there is no doubt that it was, had an enormous impact on reducing tariff barriers. In many sectors now, by the end of that period, 1994, Tariff barriers were no longer uh, or significant in many, uh, you know, in many industries. But what happened was that there was only very limited progress on uh, so-called non-tariff barriers. And non-tariff barriers are the ways of doing business in different countries. So it might relate, for example, to standards, standards for cars, or testing programs, or customs procedures, and all of these things. And the, you know, the, the hundreds of them, the differences that take place. And these are big barriers to trade. So that was really an area where they hadn't made much, uh, did, they hadn't made much progress. <coughs> okay, so, that's the, that's, so that was the, the, the GATT. So the GATT was doing you know, satisfactorily. But then there were, there were the one thing that didn't, that, un, that, that didn't exist under the general agreement on tariffs and trade was uh, uh, something on investment rules. And uh, especially the, I suppose, the United States were keen on having investment rules to protect their multinational firms. Uh, and consequently, the World Trade Organization was formed in 1985 to replace the trade-oriented uh, uh, GATT. Membership continued to grow. Um, and in particular, you had uh, 
China and then eventually Russia growing, uh, uh, um, entering after long years of negotiations, especially for, for Russia. Um, and it had some in inclusion of fo uh, foreign direct investment issues in services and intellectual property rights. But for, for, the, for the Americans and for the liberalizers in the world economy, they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't going to be satisfied unless there was an agreement on investment, agreement to uh, facilitate multinational investment. And so there was a, um, a launch of a new initiative, which was a multilateral agreement on investment. And I remember uh, I wrote a paper on the time I remember about this. I can't remember what I said, and that's the only thing. Um, except that I said that uh, it, was, it wasn't beneficial for developing countries. It was a paper I wrote with Anna, and it was, it was republished in a book somewhere, Book of Readings. Yeah, anyway, I said it wasn't beneficial for, multi for developing countries. I'm sure it had no impact, but anyway. Um, anyway, the, the, the MAI got going, but it didn't last very long, because then uh, squabbles started to appear among different sorts of people. And the, the key the key pers the key country to leading to the uh, the end of it was the withdrawal of France, and France was concerned about uh, Hollywood dominating its its uh, or eliminating its uh, its film industry. That's that was the, the situation. So the French withdrew, and then other people were getting bored about it, I guess, and uh, you know didn't think it was going to be proposal. Appropriate, and so it was the end of the that, that was, the thing broke down. So the MEI broke down, and from an, just as I'm evaluating the other things, I just evaluate this and I say it was the end of the period of liberalisation. And I can remember this. Actually, if you want to, if you want to read the history up to uh, about 2000, which was when my book with Tom Brewer was published, we have a book on this, which is about not on this but on international agreements. It's called. Um, the multinational, it's got a horrible title, that's why I can't remember it. The, mu <laughs> the multilateral investment system and multinational enterprises. My God, who ever thought of that? Eh? What a terrible title for a book. Um, um, yeah, so, what they, they, so they, were still, they were still keen to go to pursue this, uh, the United States and some other countries. And so at the next uh, round of negotiations it, within the WTO, um, they, it was held in Seattle in uh, Washington State in the US, and there was mayhem, in essence. And so it, it, it was a so-called battle for Seattle, and it was the first time that you got civil society really getting its act together. And I think in, you know, a really interesting point about all of this is the role of civil society, which has become very, very powerful in some, uh, in some instances. So there, was, there were riots be in, in uh, Seattle um, and con uh, condemnation of the World Trade Organization as a vehicle for promoting liberalization, global capitalism, and multinationals. Uh, and so the, that just reinforced the fact that the thing was dead. There was a uh, an attempt to try to uh, stimulate it again through Doha. They moved it to Doha because <laughs> They moved it to Doha because Seattle, they, obviously, they couldn't get, make any progress with the rioting. So it went to Doha, and uh, then it was abandoned. See over the things I've seen there. But you see, look at the number of countries by this time, 155 countries, and they were trying to get a grand bargain, i.e. An, an, an overarching solution for everything, and it didn't work. It didn't work because of agriculture as much as anything else. So that fell, fell apart. I'm getting there, and that was so. That was essentially the end of uh, you know this the, the end of the era of globalization. Um, and it, it, you know it's interesting because I was funny. I read uh, an article. I saw an article. That's right, in the uh, BBC News yesterday. It was, it was the question was has the global economy slowed down, and they were talking about for reasons why. The global economy has, has uh, uh, slowed down, and why globalization has slowed down. And in fact, it was interesting that just before Christmas, I was out for a meal with uh, uh, two or three friends, and some, someone just asked, 
dropped innocuously. Uh, I don't know why. Um, is, uh, is globalization dead? That's, uh, and it wasn't an academic, you know, it wasn't an academic. It was someone else said, is globalization dead? And I was sort of bemused by this, you know, is globalization. I was thinking to myself, I can't answer this question. I just have to think, go and think about it. So, f so for myself, I wrote a little note about it. This was for myself. And I said, what was I saying? Yeah, I said globalization wasn't dead, but it was, uh, you know, it wasn't very much alive. <laughs> uh, right, so that was that. Um, okay. So this, this is my final, con you know, the sort of conclusion on this. There were essentially, you got people, what you had, see, so look at the number of international investment agreements. That's bilateral investment treaties, uh, regional, and also global. 3,268. It's fantastic for lawyers, isn't it? Yeah. What? Well, minefield for lawyers. Yeah. It's a good business to go into, I must tell you that. Um, so, you know, the, it's essentially you've got this spaghetti bowl, which is all these different inter, uh, interlapping, interrelated, conflicting, complementary sorts of agreements. And then you've got lawyers making a lot of money on the basis of them. And they hadn't, uh, n nobody had tackled the, whole, the, the, the fundamental issue, which is about uh, trade FDI relationships. So as, uh, and it comes back to Pavlos's course, as you get glo global value change taking place, you have to integrate all of this stuff. You huh? um, have to integrate trade and you have to integrate <laughs> a FDI relationship together. The second question was really the, the same point that you, you made very, um, Interestingly, at the, very, at the very beginning, growth in country FDI traction policies and liberalization measures meant enhanced bargaining power from, uh, fr from multinational firms. So multinationals become more powerful than uh, especially smaller countries. And they, they, so they can implement their power through bits, through these bits agreements and so forth. Uh, and people believe the MAI to be one-sided protecting the rights and pr protection of investors, considered to have adverse effects on national cultures and environment and labor laws and developing nations' growth strategies. So that's where we are. Now, what happened, bec what happened after this? Well, during the, <coughs> during the Bush administration in the United States, they tried to operate, they tried to abandon, they, they, well, effectively, Bush, ab they abandoned any uh, efforts towards regionalism or multilateralism, and they went back to bits again, because they thought they could use their power by uh, try to, trying to um, extract stronger concessions by dealing with countries on an individual basis. So that was the, the, the first thing to do. But curiously enough, that was the, so that was the Bush administration at the top. Um, the second one, despite the, the, the failure of, of multilateralism, the United States under the Obama regime, and it's curious, you've got one, you've got the uh, Republicans, but you've also got the Democrats who are, you've got different interests here, curiously, um, also encouraged new mega regional initiatives, uh, which are TTIP, as I said, remember to pronounce it TTIP, not as we would pronounce it TTIP. Yeah. Um, the Americans always put short forms on things. Yeah. Um, so it's a transatlantic trade investment partnership and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The WTO in the circumstances now is redundant. What does it do? Can do something on trade, I suppose. It still operates the dispute settlement mechanism. <coughs> Just the final thing that I wanted to, to raise, which is really re interesting, if you think long term here, um, China, for example, doesn't like, no, nor should it, India is the same. They don't like these international agreements, especially th uh, organizations like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and so on, because they're dominated by the West. And, and, and indeed, you've got a, situ a situation, the United States pays so much of the money in a, into some, some of these organizations that it automatically gets its own leadership of the organization subsequently. Or alternatively, for some of uh, one, one of the other one, there's a, swap, uh, a switch between a European having it for, one year, for three years and an American having it for another. And the developing countries or emerging economies are left out of it. So you can understand uh, this. But what they are doing is establishing developing development banks 
um, to challenge the Western dominated World Bank and the IMF uh, and make, make sure they've got strong voting rights and so forth. If they have them, but if they're dominated, then they will. So that's where we are with this. Um, and uh, I'll just finish off and just talk about TTIP. So there we are. <coughs> so we've got the. So this is now current. We've, we've got uh, these negotiations taking place for TTIP, um, mega regional pact between the U.S. and uh, uh, the EU to stimulate trade. Um, and you see they're trying to get started in 2013. Now these things take for years. I mean, you know, it's not going to be any time soon, but I don't know, five, six years. You've always got problems because you've got elections coming <coughs> the way. Uh, you've got American elections. You've got all these European elections and so forth, yeah. And the EU Commission study estimates that TTIP could boost, see, the UD, U, e, EU G, GDP by half a percent a year and the US by half point four percent a year. And a lot to the rest of the world as well through supply chains. <coughs> Potential gains, right. Uh, so this is the big, you know, this is, this is quite a big deal actually. You know, I'm, not, I'm being slightly lighthearted about it, sorry. Um, but it is important, honestly, and especially in terms of non-tariff barriers. So you've got non-tariff barriers. Tra I said trade barriers are mostly low. The average trade barrier is 3% now. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a barrier at all. It's only in some uh, odd situations, and it show, you show how much the politics plays in all of this. Um, the, the two, of the, two of the industries where there are still high tariff barriers, for example, are running shoes. Running shoes. Now, why would there be high tariff barriers on running shoes? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So the Americans don't want uh, access to their market, do they? They want, don't, don't want people competing with uh, Nike yeah, in, the, in the American market. That's right, so exactly. So, so there's high, uh, high tariff barriers on running shoes, and there's also uh, high tariff barriers on what the term fancy chocolate. And that is who, who's, you know, who, would, who would be instigating that? Yeah, it could be the Swiss or the Belgians. That's right, exactly. That's right. So, so, there you, so, the, so these are you know, just silly examples. Not, well, not silly examples, they're important examples. But you see that they can't really... Uh, uh, so, so you, and you can also see, in fact, the, the difficulty they're going to take place for negotiations. Um, so, we, so here in Scotland, you've got things like... Um, uh, of course, haggis is banned in the United States. It's favorite food of ours, as you know. Um, but it's banned in uh, the United States. And, and uh, iron brew is also banned in the United States. Can you believe that iron brew is banned? Or yeah. <laughs> uh, well maybe, maybe you think it's a good thing. Um, anyway, that's so. So there are, uh, you know, Sorry. yeah, please. I was going to say, but because you said uh, that's banned, that's the same with the Kinder Joy eggs are also banned. The Pardon? The Kinder Joy chocolate eggs, they're also like banned. Are they? Yeah. Where about? Really? That, who who bans them? Which? I, I, no. It's the Americans that are banning them, isn't it? No, I mean, it's a, I, I'm pretty sure it's an American thing. Because it bans the yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, they are saying it's because the little thing that uh, tells on the little like, wire thing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> are they, are they, is it an American company that makes them? Oh. No, it's yeah. Oh, okay. So that's, that must be part of the negotiations then, I guess. Yeah, I, d I don't know about kinder. I've forgotten what kinder eggs look like. Yeah. Such a long time ago since my kids. I've got granddaughters now. I'll ask them about kind kinder eggs. Uh, right, so that's that. Non-tariff barriers are very important. Car design, safety testing of cars, soft furnishing, new medicines, especially new medicines, yeah. Simplification of customs procedures. Um, bowl, yeah. Areas of concern. <coughs> Gen, uh, well, the general view on this of, of, of civil society is that it's damaging to uh, workers' rights. Damaging to workers' rights and unaccountable. Um, 
the investor state dispute mechanism, sorry, settlement is, a, is an issue. Essentially, what they're proposing is that you set up a, 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 a national court, a national tribunal system for settling disputes. Uh, and the debate going on, uh, on the criticism going on, especially on the European side, is that national courts have existed forever, and why not use national courts? So that's a big, uh, you know, really big issue. And you see a lot of, uh, if you look in the, the uh, you know, put it in Google and you'll find loads of stuff about this criticism of it. Uh, food standards, the EU has got stricter regulations on GM crops, pesticides and food ad additives. <laughs> and they have this, uh, you see this fear about how the environmental regulations in the United States that they have chicken carcasses <laughs> washed. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh at that. Um, chicken car carcasses wash washed in ble bleach, yeah. That's <laughs> um, and also the hormone stuff, beef. That's, you know, they put hormones in the beef. And that. But, but also, uh, actually, the EU's got strict, stricter regulations on GM crops, but that's certainly true. But, I mean, it's also true that the uh, protesters have stopped. I mean, we, we in Britain have not been so uh, anti-GM crops, but whenever there have been trials, the protesters have come along and dug them up. So, I mean, essentially, we haven't been able to make uh, improvement on it. So, the, I don't know if the, how the EU is going to deal with some of these a items where the, the countries themselves are not uh, in, in agreement. Um, and the counterfeiting measures and uh, privacy of personal data, where well, you see that all over the news nowadays, don't you? That topic. Um, harmonization of financial regulations. And the UK, in the UK, there's a big issue about the National Health Service and worries that uh, uh, the, the health service in Britain might be opened up to um, private companies, from the private medical companies from the United States and lead to further privatization of the NHS. So who are the, who are the uh, players in all of this? Well, business is supportive, obviously. Um, uh, when when you, you, you've, you're from Germany, tell us what the German view is. What's the German view on the TTIP? I think we have like three points on Well, tell us what it is. Tell the class what it is. Uh, but that's, you know, that's a nonsense argument because they, you know, we, we, have it as, we have the same. I mean, there are, there are rules of origin within the, you know, so you can't, I mean, we have, uh, let's say, cheddar cheese or uh, scotch whiskey or whatever it is. I mean, that's, so, okay, there's a, give me some more uh, legitimate ones than that, yeah. Well, of course, that's important for the regional. Uh, I understand that, yeah. Who else, who else is uh, from Germany? Any Muslims? I'm German. Oh, yeah, okay, you too. Are you from Germany, huh? No, okay, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think the major, the major concern that is um, going on is also something to do with the environment issues. Yeah. Um, a lot of people in Germany are very sensitive about the um, uh, GM crops, for example. Yeah. Or the travel, the distances that um, food we consume travels. And with the tip, um, it's very likely that food that we consume is shipped in or flown in from all around the world. Mm. So environmental concerns are also like a big uh, Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Worker rights, of course. In Which, what, what, sorry? Yeah. Worker rights. Worker rights, yes. Um, uh -huh. Like, uh, for the EPZ, um, also, like, the eroding of the competitiveness of, of local businesses. But that's, that's all part of a the same. big discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I, what, for, for my, what I've read is also a general political anti-US anti perspective as well in, in all of this, yeah. And to some extent, it has been exacerbated by the fo uh, phone tapping. Although, sorry, for those of you who don't know uh, about this yet, there was, uh, did, did, have you heard of Edward Snowden, the uh, whistleblower? I thought everybody knew about wh Edward Snowden, the whistleblower. Yeah? Then you who don't know about Edward Snowden, you should go and Google him as soon as you get out of here. Yeah? So essentially, he, he uh, um, 
got access to a whole range of different sorts of uh, data sources. Um, and it transpired that governments were, were, phone, were ta tapping each other's phones and that the Americans had been tapping Mrs. Merkel's phone. Isn't that right? Yeah. Which uh, didn't seem the best thing to do. Uh, just before, I think they, just, they met just after that, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> So that's a, so th this is a, you know, I think there's, uh, is there an anti-German feeling, uh, sorry, anti-US feeling in Germany? Is there anti-US? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's that. Um, if you look at it, the, 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 um, the, the European Commission uh, had a, uh, a, an opinion poll about uh, people's attitudes towards, uh, towards this. I just, I wanted to give you this as an illustration. And they, they got 150,000 uh, people um, uh, responding. And the interesting thing is that 50,000 of those came from one, one civil society organization in the United Kingdom called 38 Degrees. Have you heard of it? Anybody heard of it? Yeah. Well, I didn't know about it, but my daughter, some, it must have been two or three years ago, she got me to sign up for something. I can't remember what it was. It was something... <laughs> It seemed like important at the, si the time. Anyway, I, I signed up for it, but now I get all these things from 38 degrees, you know, whenever there's a, uh, an issue that they're trying to lobby on, and uh, extremely powerful, you know. So on this matter, they were anti, they're anti the TTIP, and they got, fifth, say, they got a third of all the, the EU votes on this uh, um, uh, TTIP dimension. The U.S. situation is complicated as well because you've got, it, it doesn't split left, right, you know, it splits different sorts of ways, you know, okay, the demo, the, the, some of the lefts on the, in the Democratic Party will be against it for workers' rights and so forth, but uh, many others are promoting it, like Obama's promoting it and so on, and uh, liberal, liberal Democrats, some of the Republicans you'd expect to be, uh, all, all be, to be for it, some are for, some are against. Right. So that's more or less uh, what I was going to say on that. I, um, I don't know. I think it will go through in some form or other, but it might take several years because we've got the American election coming up, which seems to occupy <laughs> a couple of years or something. So um, you've then got, I suppose, different... Well, I don't know when the next European elections will be, um, but it's not going to be any time soon. But, but you know, if you can take away the, the emotion from this, it's really important uh, for uh, the economies of uh, the United States and Western Europe. The only other one, before I finish, is uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I should have asked you then who's the members of the Trans-Pacific Partnership since you know, seem to know all these countries. <laughs> anyway, I've got them up here, so it's just to help me. Um, so they're the members. But you see that the big thing is that uh, they were all uh, messing around, and then the U.S. joined. Since, and then it's got other countries since then, Australia, New Zealand, so on. And, you, and it's huge, huh? it's huge. Two-fifths of global output, a third of global trade. Um, and its aims are to take the Doha round forward and geopolitical aims. Well, people say it's got geopolitical aims for the U.S., which to avoid, you know, to avoid marginalization in, in, uh, in Asia and to try and, uh, I suppose, put some pressure on China. Yeah. But it's, uh, I suppose it would be logical if China was in this. <coughs> 